Hello? Hello? Yeah. Okay. A anyway, um, I I'm afraid Rob is a horrible act to follow. Um, Rob, now I understand why you're uh, at the World Economic Forum. I, I got it now. And um, I think the, the best use of your time would be to actually get up to Washington, D.C. and start to advise President Obama on what we should do with our American cities because they're pretty much, most of them are a mess. Anyway, I'm really, truly uh, impressed. Um, I just wanted to say something quickly about the uh, workshop. And what I find really remarkable is that it's a very high profile uh, workshop. Uh, a lot of very fancy teams were, uh, selected from 84 groups. So this is a very high-powered group of people. But uh, it must be maybe the first time that it is truly not an architectural-led event, where big architecture, big form-driven plans are what's going to happen. Um, these teams are all multidisciplinary. Um, they do have architects, but each team really has a very strong representation of landscape architects, or urban designers, economists, environmentalists. Um, these plans are really going to be driven by strategy, uh, by environmentalism, by kind of social and economic needs, and it's not going to be about buildings. I think most people are really trying to do the right thing. Uh, the buildings will come later, but not first. So I, I really do applaud the city uh, with their enlightened kind of way of thinking about things. Um, I first am going to kind of read a, uh, uh, well, a paper that I've written. It's about the public realm landscape. Uh, my background is in fine arts. Um, I went into landscape to build big art, and basically that's what I still do. However, um, I've become more and more engaged and interested in how the building of landscapes and in particular how design actually fits into the topic of sustainability because you don't really hear people talking about art and sustainability. Uh, so I, I think it's an important thing to, to think about. And especially, uh, I'm, I've been very frustrated with the profession of landscape architecture because we seem to be so feeble when it comes to the discussions around sustainability. Uh, where the focus of these discussions has typically been on buildings. Planners and architects and city leaders have often been slow to recognize the important role that the broader landscape that underlies our city's buildings, the spaces between the buildings that Jan Gale and Hella speak so eloquently about, that they desperately need to be considered if we are to create sustainable cities and healthy citizens. However, the focus on buildings is completely understandable as the sheer fact of the intensiveness of resources and energy used in construction and operations of buildings, as you've, as you've seen from Rob's presentation, overshadows the less resource-hungry landscape by far. As well, the development of technologies for use within buildings is a financial dripping roast for profit makers, for tech industries, as many of the environmental issues embodied in buildings can be addressed with a degree of simplicity and directness through technological innovation. Without having a technological imperative for dealing with climate change, the landscape architects have been relegated to providing green roofs for buildings, which is basically a technical section. And on a project by project basis, our scope is generally small and focuses on the technical performance of the ground plane. The lack of a clear voice for the landscape architects in this discussion is both ironic and problematic, as the landscape is the actual green part of the green discussion. But times are changing quickly, and so is the role of the urban landscape. The awareness of landscape as a built piece of infrastructure, crucial to a city's performance and livability, is a very new paradigm and still is little understood by planners and city builders. Also new are mega cities, a vast global trend towards urbanization, and a world population of 7 billion. The size and densities of these new mega cities cast the urban landscape in a whole new light. As an integrated and necessary urban element, 
that serves a great range of needs, including places for citizens to meet, to recreate, and to connect to one another. Environmental ethics is foremost in our profession, and we are taught to be the stewards or caretakers of the landscape. We know about plant communities and ecology, habitat, water systems, earth science, and bioremediation. However, the most divisive issue within our own profession has been a historical debate as to whether people are considered to be in or out of the definition of ecology. These more technically oriented subjects of study are all necessary staples in our training as landscape architects and form the substrate to our practice. However, without us having a more lateral focus to what our professional remit should be, especially during these times of rapid climate change and shifting demographies, as well as trying to march in step with the architects in their focus on form and technologies, we now find ourselves seated at the kitty table in these sustainability discussions. So where does landscape architecture fit at the round table of sustainability? What is our role as professionals, if not to do green roofs and atrias for green buildings? The answer to this rests in urban and regional scale interventions, not at the site scale. While we Americans guzzled gas for the last 50 years, Europe evolved a more expanded definition of sustainability that extends to include not only buildings, but to communities and to cities. It's within the expanded definition of sustainability that our role as landscape architects resides and presides. It's clear that with the global trend towards urbanization and the realization that we have a limited global resource, the most important role we have professionally is to encourage densification. Making livable and healthy cities is where we can be of most value. Our urban public realm landscapes are hardworking landscapes within which is embedded our sewers, water, electricity, IT connections, as well as our public transportation. It's the platform upon which we connect to each other and come together as a community. However, the public realm landscape is shaped by other human generated systems, those being the social, cultural, economic, and political systems that I call soft systems. These soft systems play a large role in making a community or livable city and are not rooted in technology, but in the physical, psychological, and emotional operations of our own very human behavior. I've observed that these soft systems are usually not rec recognized or given priority in planning and designing cities. However, without understanding their inclusion in the planning process, it will be impossible to achieve sustainability, not only on a city scale, but at any scale. The public realm landscape can also help to underwrite an urban economy by making sure that places of business are easily accessible, are well connected, and are served by lively streets and open spaces. Local businesses need to be incorporated into the planning of public realm improvements. The mayors of major cities such as London's former Mayor Ken Livingston, Mayor Bloomberg of New York, and Mayor Daly of Chicago, as well as other cities such as San Francisco, Vancouver, and Copenhagen, acknowledge the role that the public realm landscape plays in both keeping existing populations and better yet, attracting new populations to their cities so they can grow their economies and thrive. Also, understanding the monetary value of the public realm landscape is extremely important when trying to get mayors and private investors to invest in their city's public realm. In the US, without proof of, of an economic uplift, there is zero motivation to spend money on their city's landscape since it is usually seen as an unnecessary luxury. However, there has been a surge in hard data that shows what a park's value is to a city, such as New York, San Francisco, and Chicago. For example, uh, from a, a study done in 2004, it turns out that Central Park is valued at $627 million an acre, or 26% more than, than the entire 200, 2006 U.S. defense budget. It turns out that the net value of all of Manhattan would be less if Central Park were developed. And it says, quote, the city council keeps Manhattan Central Park unbuilt, not because greens rule the Big Apple, but because property values overall are higher with the park than filled with luxury condos. 
And from Millennium Park in Chicago, uh, this information was generated in 2005. 20,000 people moved into the downtown. The residential development attributable to Millennium Park was $1.4 billion. That they estimated that um, hotel earnings every year went up to 42 to 58 million dollars. Restaurant earnings went from 67 to 87 million dollars, and retail earnings went up from 53 to 71 million dollars. And that the total visitor spending over the next 10 years will be between 1.9 and 2.6 billion dollars. So the idea that parks are just frou frou and for decoration um, in cities is not true. Sophisticated mayors now consider well-educated people as capital and resource. Without an educated population, the economies of these cities cannot compete and thrive. This is especially important against the backdrop of decreasing population here in Europe. The beautification of a city and the accessibility to green spaces and tree-lined streets are used to entice knowledge-based workers to come and live and work in a city. Thus, public realm landscape is one of the primary tools for attracting people to cities. This landscape must also serve a political agenda as the will of the greater public is expressed in the public services and spaces needed for the people to work and live. The offer of parks, recreational activities, beauty and quality of life reflect the demand of a city's citizens. If the design and planning of these elements are not done in a way that the citizens and stakeholders are not included in the process, then the outcome may not be valued and maintained over time, nor serve a sustainable goal. As well, the public realm landscape underwrites both environmental and human health by providing access to public transportation, bike lanes, and well-maintained and safe sidewalks. Again, Jan, Gale, and Hella have a great deal of evidence for how bicycling not only helps the environment by cutting down carbon pollution, but keeps people more fit and brings down the costs of public health services dramatically. As well, the public realm landscape serves to facilitate water percolation, reduce runoff, allow for more trees to capture particulates in the air, and assist in reducing pollution. Very importantly, the public realm landscape provides the arena for social interaction and integration of immigrant communities. The ability for new cultures to evolve from older ones as a result of shifting demographics and world economies are done in the cities. It is here in the city's parks, sports fields, and plazas that people from different backgrounds meet and eventually forge new cultures, a necessity for growth and social evolution. Social integration is an earmark of cities that remain relevant, attractive, shh, <laughs> political, politically stable, and economically and culturally active. In cities, people of different backgrounds and cultures influence one another as they incorporate progressive lifestyle changes into the fabric of their diverse daily lives. The public realm landscape is in fact the pot in which the melting happens. The acculturation of a population cannot be done in the suburbs or in one's living room. Lastly, in a city's major civic open spaces is expressed the cultural aspirations by which a society wishes to see itself and be seen by the world. All of these components are part of the public realm landscape, an open space infrastructure that in its complexity underwrites a healthy and sustainable city. The ability for the public realm landscape of a city to provide the forum for the cultural life of a city is now of utmost importance, as the cultural and environmental health of a city is at the top of a mayor's to-do list to attract people. The cultural offer of a city is a huge tractor and is itself a new industry. Activities that were once found only inside museums and theaters are now in the streets and spaces of cities where one can enjoy street performance, concerts, art installation, and dance. The public realm landscape is the new stage for cultural events. This openness and generosity reflects a lively and open city where people from all parts of the globe can participate integrate and enjoy themselves. In addition to making sure that the public realm landscape is properly planned to provide many services to the citizens of a city, perhaps even more important is our responsibility through design to achieve and create a sense of place and engender a sense of belonging. 
As we globalize and become more homogeneous, there is an increasing need to create a new or enhanced identity that differentiates neighborhoods or cities. Our practice is often asked to create a there there and establish an identity as distinctiveness and uniqueness may give a city a competitive edge, something of crucial importance to new and regenerating cities. Creating places which are memorable, describable, and have a strong image serves an even higher function to fulfill a community scale desire to be represented as a group or as a city or even a country to the outside world. Of even greater and further importance is that the landscape and its quality or lack thereof forms the bed bedrock of our own self-image and self-esteem. It is the specifics of the planning and the design that will play a large factor in whether anything sustains over time. It is a false belief that one can achieve sustainability based on sm only on smart technologies and functioning ecosystems. People are part of the environmental equation. Nothing can sustain itself over time if people are not invested in it, either intellectually or emotionally. Design in itself cannot make cities successful, as cities are a very complex layering of moving parts. However, for a city to function maximally, the design quality of a city's public realm components becomes extremely important. Design quality is a crucial factor in whether a city can reach its fullest potential. A city's public realm landscape needs to be designed to be more than merely functional, but as wonderful, inspired, attractive places to live and work for all socioeconomic levels. Okay, I'm going to go very quickly through some images, and I'm starting off with this image of a field trip. I also, I'm a professor of landscape architecture at Harvard, uh, Harvard's Graduate School of Design. Um, I do studios, and as a matter of fact, this fall I'm going to run a studio on uh, Gothenburg River City. And we're going to bring 12 students over here and we're going to actually study the site. And uh, this shows one of the uh, field trips that we took to a small town in Greece. Those are our students. This is the mayor of Edessa who came to us because he was in a dilemma. He didn't know what to do about his city of 25,000, which was actually starting, well, was in decline. And there's Athens, Edessa. Um, it's a beautiful little city on a plateau. Um, it is at the uh, head or the bottom of a water system sitting on this ledge. But there's a fantastic waterfall that falls 200 feet below. However, it's lost its youth to the cities. It's lost its uh, agricultural economy. It's lost its light industrial economy. And now it's a city of older people and it cannot regenerate their economy. So the mayor was really uh, casting about for what to do to really um, regenerate this little town so that people could continue to live there. They did the usual, actually a very nice kind of um, pedestrianization of the downtown. Um, however, their water system uh, comes from a, a, a lake that is about five miles upstream and the lake has actually been channelized to produce electricity and thereby created a very degraded um, kind of water system in back of the city. This kind of shows the, the water system, it shows a little town that was upstream, there's Edessa. But what was interesting is that when we went there, uh, none of the people from the city had ever gone back into this area to really check out what was happening in that water valley. And the fact that it had water was an amazing thing for Greece. So we did a very complete uh, study. I won't go through this because it was, it was a very kind of complete uh, and in-depth uh, analysis, but we found out that you know, there was a lake upstream close to the mountains that fed a channel to the uh, turbine that generated electricity that was given to the grid, a wetland, and it, finally it went into Edessa. We studied kind of the water uses, we studied the makeup and the growth of the city, we did an in-depth analysis of the agricultural um, 
production and how they were using fertilizers which further polluted their water systems. We did an impact of parking which was clogging up the city kind of and, and projections for city growth. If they actually plugged into a high speed rail from Thessalonica, um, they could actually double their city. But um, there we go. Uh, this all ended up basically in a series of recommendations and ultimately a master plan, which really um, sh showed and, and demonstrated how if they took care of their water system and cleaned it up environmentally, they could actually extend their uh, tourism so that people would actually want to go back and use this area as a, a wildlife recreation area, therefore extending their stay, beefing up their economy, uh, learning how to actually farm in a more sustainable fashion, and how to actually kind of expand their city. And then, of course, each of the students after that picked one project and developed it. But it was about teaching the students how to approach this kind of problem from a, a kind of overall sustainability um, kind of directive. This is a, an, a park in Elephant and Castle in the southern part of London, of the really uh, deprived area within the city that has been converted into a playground for a, really a much underserved community. Um, the surface is an old uh, uh, graveyard. This one is a park in Beirut, it's a competition. Beirut has one of the least served uh, populations in terms of the amount of green. They also have an uh, issue with trying to regulate their open spaces because they're afraid of demonstrations. So this park had to be split between uh, a rim of neighborhood parks and a green open space inside that actually could be shut down. So, you know, it's, it was a way of trying to create a green space that did not feel like it was walled in, but you could get on top and overlook the ocean. Um, in the meantime, uh, th this kind of green bowl had at the edge a skateboard park because it has such a very young population. Um, this is an older project we did in uh, Manchester, England. It was a result of a bomb blast and the idea was to knit the city back together again. Uh, kind of really ta embracing the older part of the city with the upper shopping center part which was all granite and glass. It was essentially an ode to the train industry, but the idea was to create a great generosity of benches and places for people to hang out where they could do whatever they wanted there. Nobody said, look, go ahead and make this an amphitheater, but in fact it's turned out to be a very, very beloved space that can accommodate um, events and all sorts of things happen. It's really came to represent urban regeneration. This is a new square in Dublin's um, Docklands. It was the first open space before any of the buildings were built. Um, it's in front of Daniel Liebskin's uh, Performing Arts Theater on top of an existing garage. So we Liebskin the ground plane because the building was so aggressive. But we really wanted to create a very strong image because it was the first thing built before any of the other buildings and we wanted to create it there. There, So we extend, extended a red carpet out to the world and to the theater and uh, this actually put the Docklands on the map and now even though the city is really suffering economically, it's one region that is still thriving and being rented and people uh, are still opening up restaurants and in, in part it's because the square actually helped to maintain the vibrancy and value and created still a place to go to. Um, this one is a, a public project in Mesa, Arizona. Again, this was uh, a performing arts theater, but it was meant to insert a public space that would attract people to, this, to the city itself, to actually get people from Phoenix, Arizona to move to Mesa. So this became kind of a, it, it was really a public space, but it was built to accommodate all different kinds of uh, performance spaces. So you could have organized performance or impromptu uh, performance. There's an art gallery um, there. There's a school, an art school. And the use of water in dry places is a very interesting kind of issue. So here we created these water tables that has a very thin skim of water. Uh, this is the ditch or the arroyo which fills up periodically, a huge tank fills up with water then gushes out and then it dries up. 
a series of smaller spaces that people can break out during uh, theater breaks and come out. And then this is the this bus stop, which is actually the top of the garage, where the, the, the light wells actually light up at night. But it turned out to be that it's the number one place for people to come get married in Arizona. Um, right now, our largest project in the office is the, uh, the planning of the Abu Dhabi Corniche. And this is a big project. It goes for about eight kilometers right at the leading edge of Abu Dhabi. It's a massive project. We're kind of right at the beginning. We're trying to deal with climate change, uh, the fact that the ocean is going to rise. We've gone through a planning exercise. We're trying to make a continu continuous park, uh, dealing with kind of a dysfunctional uh, society where there's a lot of segregation with uh, new plans for connections. This shows how we work. We come up with lots and lots of ideas because we're never sure what the right idea is until we start meeting with people. And they wanted something that was much more edgy and angular. Uh, this kind of shows a two-level idea where we were raising up one level to tuck in all the buildings and the uh, different uh, building uses. This is the last one I'm showing you. This we just did. It's a, a garden show because I still like to do art projects in Xi'an, China. And uh, uh, Adrian was one of the participants. So now it stopped. Okay. God. <sighs> and um, uh, Martin, no, Martin Rhino Camp from Topo Tech was one of the participants. This shows, this is a place where the Terracotta Army was buried, and it shows these Los houses that are actually carved out. The, you, we used the idea of, of these arches. They love to luridly cover, color their trees, but it was a kind of, a, the theme was something like um, city and nature, something really kind of banal like that. And, and now I can't. Oh. Go back, yeah. So uh, we basically made a maze. We made it out of this brick that is very, very um, uh, of that of that part of the world. This gray brick, beautiful proportion, willows, which is a symbol of um, uh, of hospitality. The brass bells and mirrors. And the the site is about thirty meters by thirty meters. And this show this is a maze. And you walk into the maze and through these archways into hallways. At the end of the hallways are one-way mirrors. And you walk to the back, and there's a, basically a courtyard of willows and then you, that are mirrored. And then you walk back out the side. So it's a pretty simple. This shows the brick um, walkways, the walls. And this is an image of what this looks like. The inside of the walls is planted, uh, are planted with willows. So the willows create this um, dense green roof. And then inside the willows are a thousand bells. So this kind of shows an image of what it looks like walking through these, these hallways. Um, this is uh, being built. I was very grateful for Adrian to build. He loves building bridges, so we were able to get on bridges and look over at our installation. Thank you, West Eight. And um, this kind of shows the willows being planted inside the walls. Uh, this is the opening, and this shows our garden with this great big kind of very simple uh, minimal brick wall uh, behind which are the willows. You enter in, and right away, there is a panel of mirrors, so the hallway is now mirrored. And it turns out that the most fascinating for people are themselves. People love to look at themselves. And this was a, a image, these were images were before the trees bloomed. And then this is an image of uh, a reflection in the, in the mirror. The hallways go on forever. So it's like you're wandering through this kind of dense city. And people start playing games. So this guy was following me, and uh, we started going to war with taking pictures. Yeah. Where what? We are inside this maze of walls and openings and mirrors and walls and openings and mirrors. It goes on and on, and you can go wherever you want. Where is what? Is it the future? Uh, no, this is. 
Oh, oh no, 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 no. This is this is now. <laughs> So, I mean, you, you, it's there, you, you can, uh, you just wander through it. There we are kind of in a, there I am, in a crack. Some of these things end up in ridiculous, unhabitable spaces. And then you can see it's, it's reflected in these mirrors. But, and then you can dead end into these mirrored rooms. But, and then this is the, the room at the very end, which is actually like a mirrored, a grove of trees, so the trees go on endlessly. And then what happens as you're walking out, you can actually see the people going through the maze because they're one-way mirrors, and they can't see you. And what happened is that, um, for example, sorry for, we real, this woman is actually fixing her underwear because she, <laughs> she's not aware that we're all watching her. So we realized that this was actually a, quite a powerful situation where people are doing things and they're not aware that people are actually watching them. So this couple doesn't know that we're all watching them. She has no idea that we're watching her. And, <laughs> and uh, people would hang out in the, in the hallways watching other people. So I could have explained this in a political way, which probably would get me banned from ever going back to China. And at nighttime, uh, it looked truly surreal and scary. Okay, thank you very much. Wow. Wow. Truly mind-boggling, really. Fantastic. Uh, um, if you wish to watch the pictures uh, at a slower pace, I think they're <laughs> at, on your homepage, aren't they? Martha Swartz some partners, some of them. Yeah, you yeah. can take a close look. Would you say that the awareness of the importance of the urban landscape generally is low? Uh, not Well, it's much higher here in Scandinavia than any other place in the mm. world. So I find you guys are pretty enlightened. I feel like I'm probably preaching to the choir. But mm, I wouldn't um, be certainly too sure in the that. United States, it's very low. I mean... Mm. By and large, people have no real awareness or value for it in terms of how it functions environmentally, sustainably, or for you know, life in a city. Mm. It's not really so, high so, on the agenda. So during your, the first uh, part of your presentation, you enhanced the role of the landscape architect and the importance that politicians recognize this. But should landscape, uh, landscape artists really promote themselves better? It would help. Mm. Yeah. Uh, it, would, it would definitely help. I, I think we, as a group, have been pretty poor at being able to articulate what our, our bigger roles should be. Um, but, you know, it's been a small profession. The profession is growing greatly. Many, many more schools are open in landscape architecture. Uh, our employment rate is much better than architects, and by and large, our salaries are better than architects. And it's, it's one of the top 50 professions in the world. Okay, so it's so, improving. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Rob, where are you? Could you please step forward? We have a few more minutes because I would like to, to ask you both some questions. Is there any questions for, for any of these people? So please feel free. <coughs> Does anyone have a question? Because they're all yours for, for a few more seconds. Otherwise, I'll take over. None so far. But I would like to ask you something. You're part of the advisory board to the River City Workshop. And you're not there to, to, vision, you're not there to envision the future. You're not there, there to develop the River City. But while we're here, some distance away from the City Hall, what makes you tick? What would you like to work with on the City of Gothenburg? Well, we kind of went through that today, didn't we? Do you, you want to go, <laughs> go ahead? You start. Look, I think the, the opportunity you've got here, which is enormous, is that not only do you have a lot of space in the centre of the city where all the good things are, mm -hmm. most of that land is owned by the government. Mm -hmm. So if you want to change your future, uh, there are very few cities that have that much land that are owned by the government. And uh, I think the opportunity to increase the... Um, vitality of the downtown is right in front of us here. Uh, I think the one thing I would do in Gothenburg would make sure you build no more houses further away from the city. Mm. As Again, you grow, uh, centralisation. Centralise yep. it okay. in here. And, but 
The other thing I'd say is don't throw away the character because there's a lot of stuff here that you might look at and say it's past, it's used by that. But uh, some of the, the buildings are useful for artists, creative people who can come and use those buildings at a low rent. Mm -hmm. So I think you've got to be careful about how much you take away before you've got something to replace it with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think you've got to treat, treat the, the city uh, carefully, gently. Mm -hmm. So transform, not rebuild. Transform, definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, what gets you going in Gothenburg? Well, I mean, obviously the, the river is an incredible thing. But uh, one, one of the things that I've learned is that the people from Gothenburg often don't think about the river. You know, it's not on their mental map very much. So, I mean, that was kind of a surprise to me. But I think that the river really could be the place where, where the city does meet. And it's a way of rethinking riverfronts. Uh, I mean, it's a typical riverfront where it was industrialized. It was kind of almost like the back end of the city, you know, mm -hmm. that nice people didn't go down there. But now you have this great opportunity where you can join each other on, on, on either side of the city. Uh, so I, I think that in one sense, I mean, what, what's, what's really interesting, I mean, there are a lot of, I think, interesting dilemmas out of which can come real opportunity. But first of all, I agree with Rob 100%. I think you should draw a ring around your city and not allow any more sprawl. You know, really take the opportunity to redensify. I think that, you know, I, I forget the name of the area right to the other side, to the... The ring uh, ring, ring, ring earn, yes. Yeah. I mean, every team in the workshop loves that place. Yeah, I mean, because it, it has such interesting characters. So, I mean, that, that really is a place that I, I think everybody would agree that probably should not be touched. Um, I, I think that there are some incredible opportunities that are maybe not opportunities right now, but, you know, talking about climate change and you have issues of flooding. Mm -hmm. And I think that that could actually, you know, if you were clever, I think through design, you might be able to really think about interesting ways of... Uh, handling that, but also climate change can bring demographic shifts and people mm. to the city in ways that you've never thought about, including the fact that, you know, the ships are going to start going over the Arctic. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go around the southern route anymore. So Gothenburg could remain a port city for a very long time in the future. So there's some very interesting things to think about in the future. But You could, you could actually say go with the flow in this case, couldn't could. you? Yes? So some very interesting... But one more thing I wanted to say is that uh, I think that doing temporary installations and doing mm -hmm. temporary landscapes to get things moving yeah. is a way of, of actually starting to make change and register change that won't cost a lot of money and to get things going. I think there are things that could be done like now. Yeah, in a paradoxical way to ensure sustainability. Really? Well, to get to, people yeah. interested and committed to yeah. change. Because that's sometimes very difficult to engage people. Speaking about public realms such as parks, it's everybody's right to be there but nobody's problem. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, yeah. so uh, what do you expect uh, as an outcome from the workshop now briefly? Well, I think we, we saw today very quickly some very good ideas emerging. Mm. Um, it's not a competition. It is about getting ideas that can be put together and uh, presented back to the city. Um, I think uh, I was heartened by the fact that uh, I didn't see people talking about big architecture. They were actually talking about how to make pieces of city. And uh, I think this is a very successful process. Uh, rather than having 10 teams competing, have 10 teams that are working in collaboration to get the best outcome. So I think uh, the city should be congratulated for um, bringing together a process like this. Uh, it's unusual. Uh, I only know of it happening once before, I think, in Hamburg. Um, and it's a, it's a very good process. Mm. So what are your hopes for, for Saturday presentation? I hope that the powers that be have the political will and the braveness mm that Rob was talking about. Yeah. So we're actually back to where we started. We need yeah. brave politicians to make this happen. So this was today, uh, the first of three 
public events. Tomorrow, I hope to see you here back again at uh, half past six, 17.30, when architect Helle Suholt from Gale Architects in Copenhagen is going to talk about people's perspective in planning and quality of life in cities. And you'll also be able to listen to Professor Lars Reutesvert, director of Mr. Urban Futures and director of UN Habitat Global Division. And he's going to elaborate on Elvstaden as a new construction agenda in an international perspective. And don't miss the final presentation that we just referred to on Saturday at Handelshög Skolan. From 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock, the 10 expert teams will then present their visions and ideas about River City Gothenburg. So thank you very much. Hope to see you again. And don't forget to come visit us at the old city hall. You're welcome. Thank you.